But okay, so um, title is uh, Snow Spikes in the Dry Andes, but maybe not on Europa. So uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, snow spikes like you see here in this picture, and then we'll consider whether similar structures could occur on Jupiter's moon Europa, as has recently been claimed. And when we get to that part of the presentation, I'll turn it over to Kevin Hand, who's an expert on Europa. Oh, slides are not advancing. So, try. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. So, if you go to northern Chile and go up into the mountains in early uh, summer, the snow is uh, fading away, but you'll see snow patches around. And it looks kind of ordinary. But when you get closer, you see this is not ordinary snow. It's got some roughness to it. And when you get even closer, you stop the car and get out and have a look and say, wow, this is pretty amazing. And so these pictures um, were taken uh, in Northern Chile. So you see Santiago, the center of Chile is right here. And then up north from La Serena up to the east. Uh, that's where those pictures were taken. I'll be showing some more from that area. And then also from farther up north, um, The um, classic paper describing these snow structures was um, by Louis Liboutry in 1954. Um, we, many of us know that Louis Liboutry was the founder of the laboratory of glaciology at Grenoble. Uh, but before he did that, he uh, spent several years at the University of Chile, uh, where he was uh, doing research on glaciers and studied these snow structures among other things. And he titled his paper, The Origin of Penitence. So we need to find out why he has that name. Uh, but first, here's the definition. Penitents are spikes of old compact winter snow or of glacier ice, roughly ranged in an east-west direction, which in the Andes of Santiago in summer, cover all the snow fields and glaciers between 4,000 and 5,000 meters. At higher elevations, they, excessively, they successively lose their sharp I'm <laughs> missing some of the words here because of things that appear. But anyway, at higher altitudes, um, penitents don't form. <laughs> Having trouble. Oh, yeah, may, remains powdery too long to form penitents. Now, there's an asterisk there for the name. And what he's done is translate the word that's used in Chile and Argentina in Spanish. It's penitentes. And that just means penitence in English and has some other words in uh, other languages. Um, but I think, um, yeah, um, he, re uh, Liberty recommended that in English language publications, we should use the word penitence. Um, but penitentes is, is also used. In fact, it's becoming more common now and um, in a paper that I wrote some years ago, I accepted Liboutry's recommendation that in, Eng in English language publications, we should say penitence. But it turned out that at every occurrence of that word, the copy editor changed it to penitentes. So to answer the question, which is it? Well, the copy editor decides. So I'm familiar with saying penitence. So mostly I'll say that in this talk. So a good description for why they have that name was given by Post and La Chapelle. Um, with the advent of warm weather, the tips of the snow pinnacles, which are normally quite hard and stiff, they often droop or bend over. You've got warm wind in the afternoon or a weak wind in the afternoon, uh, giving the appearance of ranks of hooded monks with their heads bowed in prayer, hence the term penitent. And Liboutry was so intrigued by these snow structures that he actually put a drawing of them on the front cover of both volumes of his two volume treatise of glaciology. Um, and this diagram actually shows a lot about uh, how they're formed. Um, they're the result of a selection process in which um, surfaces facing the sun absorb more radiation and ablate more quickly. So the surviving surfaces 
are, and are nearly vertical wedges that are oriented east-west. So the sun comes up in the east, goes across the sky, sets in the west, and these surfaces that survive are the ones that remain parallel to the solar beam most of the time. And so they're tilted in south southern hemisphere toward the north at approximately the noontime solar zenith angle. Um, and in Libetri's words, the orientation of the penitent is such that at all hours of the day, the solar rays meet the surface as tangentially as possible. The penitent, however large, does not cast a shadow and cannot intercept much solar radiation. So here's a couple of pictures from his book. This is looking to the east. Um, you see the tilting and they look like spikes. You can't really tell that they're wedges, but then when you turn around 90 degrees, you look to the south, you see they're actually in the form of uh, wedges. Um, now, a lot of you, I'm sure, have already made the connection that, well, aren't they just like sun cups that are exaggerated? You've got a, just a deeper trough and, um, and a, a steeper sidewall. So sun cups are common in summer on mountain glaciers and snow fields uh, worldwide. So yeah, there is a connection, uh, but first some terminology. Their sun cups are also called honeycomb snow or ablation hollows. Ablation hollows to sort of be non-prejudicial because sometimes these structures can occur, can form without uh, the sun. Or ablation polygons or in a Japanese publication <laughs> translated to tortoise shell patterns. And then penitents, also called penitentes, Nieve penitente has been used, but Libutri scorns that term, saying it's uh, bad Spanish. And then in German, Büsserschne, because Büsser actually means penitent. Sun pits is to emphasize that the penitents don't grow, is that the pits get deeper, and so it's really the pits where the action is. And then there are intermediate forms. This is on the south side of Mount Rainier, where uh, deep sun cups sometimes occur in late summer. So the description that Libutri uh, gave for the mountains above uh, Santiago is that there's uh, three ranges of altitude in the, in the summer. There's below 4,000 meters, sun cups, above 5,200 meters, flat, cold, dry snow, and in between the penitents. So there are qualitatively different uh, processes there. Sun cups are melting at all parts of the surface the troughs and the peaks. Uh, where, where it's up high and cold, the dry snow is only sublimating, there's no melting. And the penitents are in this intermediate region. They're sublimating at the peaks, but melting in the troughs. So in Libertree's words, the sublimation of snow or ice allows the crests to maintain their temperature below zero degrees, while in the spaces between the penitents where radiation is concentrated and removal of water vapor not so easy, melting takes place. <coughs> and that's, um, the idea is that you've got a, a, a moderate wind that's dry. Lo, uh, it may actually be above zero, but the dew point temperature has to be below zero. So it's a, it's a dry air. So you can get sublimation and the peaks are going to be colder than the air and definitely below zero degrees. And so they're only sub, subliming or sublimating. And the sunlight is coming in and exposing, and the troughs are oriented toward the sun. So they're getting exposed to a lot of sunlight, but they have another problem in that there's, uh, they're protected from the wind. And so the air becomes stagnant and humid because it's surrounded by ice. And, and uh, so the sunlight is absorbed and cannot be used to, or that heat cannot be um, spent by sublimating. And so the temperature has to rise to the melting point and you get melting. So you get this extreme topography. Now there's something similar going on, well, not with melting and sublimation, but with exposure to the sun down in the desert below, in the Atacama Desert down below the mountains, where you have these barrel cactus. This is a picture I took in Arizona, but they're also in, uh, in uh, Chile. And they're getting enough sunlight from uh, the diffuse radiation from the sky to, for photosynthesis. And so they don't want more than that, so they won't heat up. So they put more spikes on the, on the top 
to reflect the sunlight. So you have a high albedo on the sun facing side and on the faces not intercepting much sunlight or certainly not intercepting direct sunlight. Um, they're, uh, they're, uh, uh, can have a lower albedo. And so they do tilt toward the, toward the north in the Atacama Desert. And I didn't take this picture, but it is from the Atacama Desert. So like the penitents. Then, uh, so mechanisms for deepening of surface irregularity. You start out with some random tiny irregularities and they can grow by both by sunlight and also by um, a latent heat process. And two parts of the sunlight argument is that uh, different orientations of the surface are illuminated differently. So in this um, diagram, you see the, the sunlight is shining more directly on this surface that's facing the sun, so it's going to melt away faster and um, or sublime away faster. And so the, in the case of sun cups, the trough is going to, it's going to deepen and also the horizontal location is going to move, uh, is going to move away from the sun. And then there's a second process in that, um, or a second, yeah, process in that the trough is illuminated not only directly from the sun, but also by radiation reflected from the sidewalls, uh, what the planetary scientists call self-illumination. So day by day, as the field of sun cups is uh, ablating, the surface is lowering, but the location of the peaks and troughs is migrating away from the sun. And this is described in Post and LaChapelle's book that um, you're getting more melt on one side of the cup than on the other. This causes the field of sun cups to migrate as the cups deepen and form. And in the Northern hemisphere, this migration is toward the north and it can amount to several centimeters a day. And Ed LaChapelle actually measured that and he explained to me how he was able to measure it without actually disturbing the snow. Yeah, so if you were a, a little bug crawling around in the bottom of a sun cup, you'd get to experience this extremely bright environment where you're getting illumination also from the sidewalls. And I'm too large to crawl around in the bottom of a sun cup. Well, most sun cups anyway aren't large enough. So for me to experience that, I had to go to a much larger cup, uh, the crater of the Leaken Copper volcano in the winter when the surrounding walls are covered with snow and down there, the sun was high and the walls are covered with snow. And this is the brightest place I've ever been in my life. Um, and just as an aside, this was winter. So the, so the uh, lake, the crater lake was frozen, but in summer it melts and I heard that the world's record for high altitude kayaking was set in this lake at 6,000 meters and if I'd been thinking I should have brought some ice skates along and maybe I could have set the record for high altitude ice skating. Okay back to these uh, mechanisms. Now second mechanism besides sunlight is evaporation sublimation versus melting. So you have a big difference in the latent heat, ratio of seven and a half or eight and a half between sublimation and melting. Um, so let's look at sun cups first. The, um, the ridges are exposed to the wind so they can dispose of their absorbed solar energy by evaporation. Whereas the hollows, the air is stagnant, they're far more humid. So if temperature is at zero everywhere, but, um, and you have melting everywhere, but in the trough, you have essentially only melting because no wind and high relative humidity, whereas the air flowing across has a lower humidity so that you can get evaporation and sublimation. So you get enhanced ablation, in this case melting, at the, uh, in the trough, in the hollow. And then penitents are spikier than sun cups because there's no melting at the peaks. They're uh, only sublimating and you have the sunlight shining more directly into the troughs and melting. So then just to summarize Nibu Tree's observations, they grow in late spring and early summer, they decay in late summer by melting, restricted elevation range, wedges oriented east-west, tilt toward the north, sublimation from the spikes and melting in the troughs. 
Now, Libutri's paper did not actually have in, contain the words latent heat. So you have to kind of read carefully between the lines. Here's really a phrase that expresses that. The, the speed of the process depends on a thermal balance so that melting goes further than sublimation. To get him to be more explicit about this, you have to go to one of his other more obscure papers, which was written in French, where he has this phrase, which translated says, as melting requires fewer, many fewer calories than sublimation, the trough will deepen rapidly. So yeah, 80 calories versus 680 calories per gram. So factor 8.5. Um, here's a case study that Libutri uh, pointed out in, oh, in his book, and I'm just going to highlight a few words out of it. Uh, that the peak of the penitent had a temperature of minus five, but the air temperature was plus 10. So he points out it's an intense evaporation which permits such a blade to maintain itself below zero in an air which is clearly above zero. So it had low relative humidity, maybe 40%. On, um, yeah, so yeah, I should say uh, Libutri also describes what he calls micropenitence in the cold snow before the melting begins. Uh, you can get a few centimeters uh, uh, of relief just from sublimation alone. And this is what can happen in the intermediate zone where penitents do grow. The snow is mostly flat in the winter, but then when uh, it's warm enough for melting to begin in the troughs, then you get much stronger relief. And these micropenitents have actually been grown in the laboratory, actually by a number of groups now, including Kevin's group, that Meredith Betterton and her um, collaborators grew, took a block of snow, put it into the lab, and sh shined a spotlight on it, and grew conical micropenitents, a few centimeters so high. And so the two mechanisms work together. Uh, the, the, the solar, um, which is what this is, but then also the latent heat, which can give you a much greater relief. And subsequent field measurements have confirmed Libutri's conclusions. There's uh, reports from Pakistan, from Tajikistan, and from Argentina. I'll just give you some quotes from some of these. Norbert Untersteiner from his expedition in the Karakoram, 1957. Um, concluded that from his measurements of energy budget, evaporation or sublimation is important for the energy budget of penitence, but melting dominates the mass budget. Um, and then Vladimir Kotlyakov in uh, an expedition to the East Pamirs, the facets, the peaks were dry, but in the hollows, the fern was soft and humid. Melting on the surface perpendicular to midday, solar rays can reach 20 to 30 millimeters per day. And then the surface was smooth on the upper part of the glacier where there wasn't melting. Narusa and Leiva on the other side of the Andes in Argentina, all the field data obtained are consistent with and support Libutri's hypothesis. Um, the shape of penitence is in favor of an inhomogeneous ablation pattern, enhanced melting at the bottoms, and ceased melting at the top due to cooling by sublimation. Um, and there's um, now recently a lot of modern work that's quantified some of Libutri's descriptions on shortwave radiation, longwave radiation, albedo, air temperature, surface temperature, humidity, measurements of isotopes and ions. And this work is being done in Chile by um, by workers at uh, the Center for Advanced Studies in Arid Zones. Uh, work led uh, a lot of it by Lindsay Nicholson, and now more recently by Shelley McDonnell, who's uh, stationed there now. And I'll just show you some of their uh, papers. Um, here's a paper led by Lindsay Nicholson, um, but also with Shelley. This was uh, measurements of the topography on a um, uh, how as penitence developed over a period of uh, five or six weeks in the Appalachian area of a glacier. And they showed here that from left to right between November and January, the penitence became uh, 
fewer, wider, and deeper. So they seem to um, to grow into their neighbors and become um, um, larger with time and deeper. Also, they noted that the airflow over the penitence was what they called skimming. So it was conducive to development of a microclimate in the troughs. Then when uh, this group uh, Shelley uh, led wanted to study sublimation processes without the complication of penitence, they went up high where the melting was rare onto a penitent free surface in the upper part of the Guanaco Glacier. 5,300 meters. Okay, now a little travel log. And that's because I had been to the Andes on three separate trips at tourist trips, but never was at the right place at the right time to experience the penitent. So I decided I really needed to plan a dedicated trip solely for that purpose. So I went for two weeks in December with uh, Peter Mullen and his daughter Darcy who uh, speaks uh, fluent Spanish. And we started out in Santiago, went up to La Serena, and were joined by Lindsay Nicholson and Mike Schultz and went for a few days up east. Um, to, uh, yeah, Lindsay at that time was employed by um, Sayasa. So the road goes from La Serena up to the east and across the uh, pass into um, Argentina. And here is the pass and the international boundary, Chile, Argentina. And here are the penitents. Now these are mostly on, on well actually all the ones that we saw on this trip were just on, on uh, bare ground. They had melted their way down to the bare ground. And they're about as tall as, uh, as Peter. And they're tilted. And not very much, um, because at this time of year, the solar zenith angle at noon is only eight and a half degrees. And because uh, they're down to bare ground, that's uh, low albedo absorbing more sunlight. And so the melting under the penitence and undercutting the penitence. So a lot of them are toppling over as they are undercut. And then after we left, um, um, Lindsay and Mike, where the three of us went up north to Copiapó and then east up to Ojos del Salado, which is the second highest mountain in the Andes, and up and drove up to the end of the road, 5,200 meters, and that was where I had an opportunity to commune with my friends, the penitents, by laying out my sleeping bag and spent the night there. Um, but we're now uh, getting to the end of the short life of these penitents as the weather warms later on in December at this latitude. Okay, well now these penitents are beautiful. Um, however, they can cause uh, difficulty. For example, if you're trying to climb Aconcagua, you're going to be cursing at the penitents for slowing your progress. And uh, there was, uh, yeah, from this paper from 1939, Chester Wentworth is complaining that on uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii that snow spikes made tobogganing impossible. So they are these difficulties caused by uh, penitents, um, but a possibly more serious hazard is was actually the reason that I got into this uh, and made this talk at this point was because two years ago, um, a claim was made that they could be a problem for uh, planetary exploration. And here's a news article from EOS, huge blades of ice may partially cover Jupiter's moon Europa. And uh, these blades could prevent a lander from exploring parts of Europa. And then it's accompanied by a picture from Chile, not of Europa, but we need to go to Europa and uh, see what's going on. It's one of four large moons of Jupiter and it's about the size of Earth's moon. And its surface is a layer of ice, several kilometers thick, covering a deep ocean of liquid water. Here's another news article, this one from Nature. Uh, ice spikes span a Jovian moon. So there they've uh, 
made it pretty definite with another picture from uh, Chile. Okay, so here's the paper that they're in referring to, Formation of Meter Scale Bladed Roughness on Europa Surface by Ablation of Ice by Daniel Hobley and his co-workers. Um, we estimate that penitentes on Europa could reach 15 meters in depth. We suggest that penitentes could pose a hazard to a future lander on Europa. So, well, well, the highest temperatures, noontime equatorial temperature at the surface of Europa is 134 Kelvin. So, of course, there's no melting of the ice surface ever. So, what were they thinking? Well, here's what they're thinking. This is the first paragraph on Earth. Well-developed penitentes requires a melt-free environment, reference 12. Sublimation in the absence of melting is particularly essential for penitente formation. Again, uh, reference 12. Reference 12 is Libuti's paper in which he says, although sublimation is indispensable for penitent formation, in a field of penitence, most of the ablation proceeds from melting. So um, I suggest that, well, Hobley should have edited their sentence. There's just one word. Instead of saying sublimation in the absence of melting, sublimation in the presence of melting is particularly essential for penitente formation. And so my recommendation to students, read what you cite. Um, and they did include, as figure one of their paper about Europa, they included this picture from Chile. Well, it was a picture taken at the ALMA telescope site. And I, um, I happened to have been there actually in the winter. Melting occurs there in the summer and you get penitents, but I was on a snow sampling expedition in the winter and then there were no penitents or even micro penitents because at that time of year only sublimation can occur. Um, Hobley, uh, at all did not um, did not uh, compute the um, the development of penitence. Instead, what they did was um, just do a a calculation and step by step, a simple calculation. They said this is the maximum temperature. This tells you the sublimation rate determined by the radiation energy budget, and then water vapor diffuses rapidly into the near vacuum atmosphere. The surface is renewed by ice motion, average age 50 million years. So in 50 million years, 15 meters of ice could sublimate. And if most of that sublimation occurs in the troughs and if erosion by meteorites, so-called impact gardening is slow, then the penitence could be 15 meters high. And they assumed an aspect ratio of two to one. So 15 meters high, seven and a half meters spacing. And we'll get um, Kevin to say more about that. But, um, what else do we have there? Next slide, if I can find it. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, well, Europa is not Chile. In, Ch in Chile, it seems we need melting, but, and, but penitents in Chile, they have to grow tall in just four months and then they melt. But on Europa, there's more time available, a lot more time. Penitents can take 50 million years to grow. So we need to consider whether we could grow large penitents without uh, the melting process. But of course there are erosional processes that could, uh, that could damage the penitents before they get to 15 meters high. And we need to ask what is responsible for Europa's albedo? It's ice, but it's obviously not pure ice. It's got um, something that's causing it to have a high albedo. If we look at snow and ice albedos on Earth, they cover quite a wide range. There's anywhere from very dark ice to very bright snow. Um, this is on a frozen lake in Canada, and pure clear ice has an albedo of 0.07, 7%. Lake ice with cracks, like the lake ice in this picture, uh, 0.1. Glacier ice um, bubbles to the scattering, so you get a high albedo of 0.6, and snow, has an even higher albedo because it's refraction through small particles and depends on the size of the grains, 0.8 or even a little higher. Now on your Europa, um, there are meteorite impacts and there's also emissions from Jupiter that are 
impacting the surface. And so it's being pulverized into small particles with large specific surface area like snow. And in some places, there's probably also frost. So possibly the impacts could also erode the penitence. Um, but oh, I'm gonna look at some evidence for and against. Uh, Europa, well, as evidence for the plausibility of penitence, Hobley et al. provided data on radar reflectivity at wavelength 12.6 centimeters, which they claimed would be consistent with spiky roughness. But there have been other explanations proposed having to do with subsurface roughness or subsurface heterogeneity. And that's because the absorption length in ice for 12.6 centimeter radar is 100 meters. So they do penetrate quite a bit. Now, my expertise is definitely not on radar, but I do know a lot about albedo. So I'm gonna talk about maybe some evidence from albedo. We, when you take a flat surface, sunlight that gets reflected from it, well, it can go out to space. But if you get reflection of sunlight from the side wall of a penitent, it doesn't necessarily escape to space. It can be reflected across and very likely will be reflected across, get another chance to be absorbed on the other face. So um, a rough surface has a lower albedo than a flat surface. And we call that trapping. So penitence trap solar radiation, reduced, resulting in a reduced albedo of a field of penitence relative to a flat surface. And here's uh, pictures from a paper by uh, Steph Lermite on the top, Tapado Glacier in Chile. That, um, and here, yeah, his radiometers uh, at various heights above the surface to see how high you need to go to get a representative view. And he concluded that the penitence caused a reduction of albedo from the flat surface albedo of 0.64 down to uh, 0.32. And we get corroboration of that from a radiative transfer model by Matt Kathis when he was a um, graduate student with um, uh, Doug McHale's group. Um, and the penitents in his model, they caused a reduction of albedo from 0.6 down to 0.33. So about a 0.3 reduction in albedo in both of those cases. And possibly we're seeing this visually by comparing uh, you know, these flat surfaces of fallen penitents to the intact penitent field where there's uh, this trapping going on. Oops. Um, now, so suppose a flat surface on Europa had at a particular wavelength was 0.7, then penitents would be expected to reduce the area average albedo down to about 0.4. But there are measurements of this and the area averaged albedo of the leading side of Europa, which is the clean side, it's quite high, averaging 0.72 at mid visible wavelengths, which suggests that penitents, if present, are not prominent. They wouldn't have such a high albedo. And uh, then after the Hotley paper came out, there was also measurements of the angular dependence of the visible reflectance that argues against meter scale surface roughness. So I submitted a comment to Nature Geoscience, a comment on the Hopley paper, and I titled it, Don't Give Up on the Europa Lander. And uh, the, but I got a reply from the editors saying they were not gonna publish my comment because they'd already accepted another comment on that paper uh, by Kevin Hand and his coworkers. Um, there wasn't much overlap because my paper was mostly about the earth except for the albedo argument, and Kevin's was all about Europa. Um, so that's the status, and now I'm going to turn it over to Kevin, who is the project scientist for the Europa Lander mission. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Am I coming through clearly? Yep. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Is the um, is my display working okay? Yep. Uh, great. Well, um, first and foremost, uh, uh, thank you so much, Steve and and Tavi and and uh, everyone else for uh, giving me the chance to speak on this this topic briefly today. Um, uh, Steve and I have had a lot of fun uh, brainstorming on this and. In full disclosure, uh, I am biased on this topic, uh, as Steve mentioned. So much of my role at JPL is helping lead the effort scientifically to 
put a lander down on the surface of Europa, you can see a, a beautiful animation of that mission concept shown here. Um, to be uh, absolutely uh, correct with the terminology, this, this mission is still in concept phase. Uh, it's uh, in what we call pre-phase A. We're hoping that it will get prioritized in the coming decade or decades, um, but uh, right now it doesn't have the, the green light. And to that end, uh, I would invite any and all of you to, uh, to join if you're interested in this mission. We're always looking for um, expanding the scientific community and getting more uh, people engaged. So uh, yes, I'm a, I'm a little bit biased in this because we are, uh, we are looking at um, how and, and where we would possibly send a lander. I should mention that uh, long before a lander sits down on Europa, we will have data from the Europa Clipper mission. And I'm a co-I on that. I won't speak to that mission in detail, but that mission will take all sorts of imagery, spectroscopy, uh, ice penetrating radar data that will help us identify potential landing sites and certify them from a, uh, a safety standpoint and a science standpoint. Oops, let's see, I'm having the same issue you were, see, there we go, okay. Uh, and so the motivation, at least from my standpoint in figuring out whether or not penitentes form comes in part because we want to know what the surface of Europa looks like at the centimeter to meter scale, the scale that is relevant for landing on the surface. And of course, the, the physics of the snow and ice interaction with the atmosphere on earth to form penitentes is, is uh, intrinsically interesting and has all sorts of ramifications for, um, for the hydrology occurring here on Earth. On right is one of the highest resolution images that we have of Europa. That's about six meters per pixel in the foreground. This is kind of an airplane view looking out on Europa's surface as seen from the Galileo spacecraft. That cliff in the center is perhaps a couple hundred meters in height. This is a grayscale image Everything in black or gray that you see um, is some non-ice material, perhaps salts, perhaps sulfuric acid, um, any number of possible uh, alternative compositions. Okay, so um, as Steve mentioned, the, the previous work, uh, at least in my opinion and the opinion of our team, was uh, a bit overly simplistic and it extrapolated from earth conditions and then used Europa's surface sublimation rate and average surface age to infer the existence of, um, of large penitentes on Europa. The main problem, simply put, is that Europa is not the earth. Europa has no atmosphere uh, and related to that, very importantly, there is no vapor diffusion layer on Europa. And on earth, you can think of this as uh, largely a measure of the relative humidity above the ice and within the penitente troughs. And uh, Steve detailed a lot of that dynamics in, in his section. Um, related to that, give, Europa has no atmosphere. It's just the, the cold darkness of space. Europa's surface is about 100 Kelvin. And so if you are a slightly warmed up molecule uh, in the ice on the, on the surface, you pop off and you go for of order a thousand kilometers. Uh, your mean free, free path is very large. And what we know from the study of penitentes on Earth, the physics of penitentes on Earth require some sort of atmospheric fluid layer coupled with the irradiance and self-illumination to generate that differential sublimation, which ultimately yields the, the peaks and valleys. So the physics of penitentes does not work on Europa, we argue. In addition, and I won't get into this in much detail, we can perhaps come back to it, the, 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 um, the chemistry is wrong. Europa's ice is not meteoric and clean the way glaciers are for the most part with uh, uh, dust and, and other contaminants aside. Uh, Europa's ice is more like sea ice. It's derived from the ocean and is salty. Some regions also have sulfuric acid, uh, some hydrogen peroxide, but the detail on that is a different talk. Uh, shown it right here, just another um, uh, fun example of penitentes. These are some pictures that I took on top of Kilimanjaro. And again, relating back to Steve's um, talk, you can see these are basically pointing straight up because they are equatorial. Um, so what do we know about the physics of penitente formation? Well, again, um, a, a simple way to think about where Europa falls in the regime that Steve presented uh, Europa would be like the highest altitude regime where you just have that, that kind of flat sublimation erosion occurring. You don't have the differential 
modulation of penitentes, nor do you have the kind of um, melting that Steve described, and you also uh, don't have the, the, the sun cup physics. Um, now, a lot of great uh, papers have been published, and, and Steve went through a bunch of those. In addition, I also want to call your attention to this paper by Claudin et al., which is uh, quite a wonderful paper. Um, it's, uh, um, it's a mathematically impressive paper, to say the least. And uh, I, I won't spend too much time on this in the interest of, of getting to some questions. But um, the culmination of this paper is basically this dispersion relation that Claudin and all developed. And that's shown at the bottom left there. And this relation uh, relates the growth rate to the wave number uh, on, the, uh, on the surface of the ice. And the, the first term, that positive term, let's see if I can uh, use a pointer here, pointer, laser pointer, there we go. Okay, so this first term here um, accounts for the temperature gradient, the second term uh, accounts for self-illumination. Both of these term, terms lead to erosion of the surface. The final term, this term accounts for the stabilizing effect of vapor diffusion above the surface. And so this counterbalances the other two. And so as I show in sort of diagram form here, if you get rid of that vapor diffusion term, now you're just left with those other two terms uh, and you, you enter sort of a, a runaway sublimation. Uh, I won't go into detail here in the interest of, of time. I'll, I'll just uh, refer you to this paper where they go into the dimensionless parameter uh, P. And what we did in our rebuttal to the, um, the, the paper that, that Steve showed uh, was basically said, listen, this is, this is the best sort of mathematical formulation. Oops. So my, let's see, there we go, that's the slide I was looking for. Um, Claudin and I'll present the best sort of physics, mathematic, mathematical formulation of how penitentes work on earth. As a limiting case, let's just consider how we would use that formulation and apply it to Europa. And basically what you end up doing is driving that value P uh, to zero. And when you look at how that then relates to the wavelength of, of penitentes, it results in this relationship between the albedo and lambda, the, uh, the wavelength and the boundary layer thickness. So up here at L equals 0.1 centimeter, you're kind of at a thin uh, regime for earth boundary layer thickness. And as you go uh, smaller and smaller, you get more European and your penitentes get smaller and smaller. So as you leave the quote unquote fluid regime uh, and enter that collisionless, no atmosphere regime of something like Europa, uh, you go to smaller and smaller penitentes and eventually uh, uniform runaway sublimation. And this is, is, sorry, this is exactly consistent with what Steve said, whereas you get up to those higher altitude uh, uh, mountain regimes, you see the micro penitentes. And so sure enough, um, uh, as much as we love the math and physics of, of this paper, we said, well, let's, let's see what we can do in the lab. And uh, in our lab, we've got a few different chambers, enough math into the lab, um, two of which are what we call our stockpot chambers. These allow us to do rapid prototyping and enable us to replicate Earth down to sort of Mars conditions. And there's Jeff Foster. Uh, wonderful uh, and brilliant lab tech who's uh, helped run a lot of these experiments. And on the right there, you see our initial conditions. We start with flat, clean ice. And then over time, as we shine this halogen lamp into the chamber and simulate the um, uh, solar uh, irradiation, we grow these micro penitentes at the low temperatures and, um, and low pressures. Uh, now, this, of course, doesn't replicate Europa. For Europa, we need a, uh, a bigger chamber. Um, and uh, that's what this is. This is our, what we call our arc. Uh, we call it the arc because it um, resembles the arc from the Raiders, Raiders of the Lost Ark films, as you can see with our little Capcom taped um, uh, movie image on the right there. Uh, inside the arc, 
this is what it looks like. And what you're seeing here is an experiment that we ran, and I'll actually e exit out of this and I'll show you a time-lapse video of this. Uh, I think I've got enough time to, to share with you a couple of those. But in brief, inside the arc, there's an LED bar. Um, if you can see my pointer, you can see that up in the, uh, uh, along the roof. This LED bar scans across to simulate the um, sunrise and sunset. Uh, inside the chamber, we get down to about 10 to the minus four tor. Uh, we get down to 120-ish Kelvin. Uh, and on this experiment, we started with just clean ice. You're looking at the end state here. We started with clean, flat ice at about 130 Kelvin and just let it run. We re let it run for months. And uh, after a few months, we started to increase the temperature in roughly five Kelvin increments. And uh, by the end of the experiment, about seven months in, we were at 165, close to 170 Kelvin. And we started to see some interesting cold trap morphologies. We did not see penitentes form. And I should be clear, even though I think the physics of penitentes doesn't work under Europa conditions, that doesn't mean that I don't think other interesting morphologies do not occur. And that's part of what these experiments were designed to uh, um, illuminate. And sure enough, we we formed in the slightly colder regions of our chamber, these roundish dome-like features that you see in the foreground here. And uh, we showed a couple of those pictures, the, the micropenitentes under sort of Earth and Mars conditions in our uh, matters arising. And then we ended with a, um, a downward looking image of those dome-like structures that you saw. So, uh, in summary, we think that the, the physics of penitentes doesn't work on the, um, in the rarefied atmosphere of Europa uh, for a number of different reasons, uh, some of which are the relative humidity, the lack of uh, the boundary layer. Uh, and in that article, we also detail some of the uh, other evidence that the initial article points to, things like the radar signature, et cetera. So, I encourage you to please read that paper. And then with our experiments, uh, we think we've got some empirical um, uh, support that, uh, that the physics does not work. So this may, apologies if this hypnotizes you. Um, Steve and Tavi, is the, is the movie playing? Uh, yes, I can see the movie. Okay, I'm going to speed it up to 5x. And again, apologies. You might, uh, please don't look at this uh, if uh, I don't want anybody to have a seizure. Um, and so you can see the temperature increasing. Uh, the days are rapidly going by. Those are thermocouples. And in the foreground here, you can see the, the beginning of um, accumulation of the, uh, the water that was lost around the perimeter of the chamber, which was slightly warmer and the accumulation into these botroidal dome-like uh, structures. Uh, now we're at 170 Kelvin, and that rise that you see is actually uh, additional growth. It, it almost looks like a, a, a suite of marshmallows uh, growing. Uh, one more little video. This is, uh, this is one of the micro penitentes um, inside the stock pot, and I'll speed this up too just in the interest of time. You can see the, the pit in the center where the halogen lamp is shining through. Uh, this is a little wire in the foreground from the thermocouple. Apologies for that. But you can see the micro is gradually forming. So um, I, I think that's a, that's a good place to end. Um, I got a video of the Europa Lander animation if, if you're interested and we have time. But why don't I stop there, Tavi, and, and we can uh, hopefully have time for, for some questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, do we have any questions for uh, Kevin and Steve? I have I... a question. Go, go ahead, Gillian. Um, I had a question about the, the aspect of Europa and the prevalence of what I'm guessing would be like leads. Um, I understand you said that there's the ice surface and um, water that's underneath the ice surface. And you also spoke a little bit about the boundary layer. I'm, I'm guessing you mean clouds with that. 
Um, how I understand Leeds to operate um, in the Arctic here is, uh, in terms of um, boundary layer clouds, is um, with the different uh, ice types. So you'd have thinner ice or an open water lead. How do you, how do, is it that, is that the reason why you only have a very um, thin boundary layer cloud in Europa because you don't have exposed water in Europa? Or how does that mechanism? It's, um, uh, so I'll actually split that into two different pieces because it, it, it's a very interesting um, uh, point when you think about uh, the ice fracturing and opening up a, a, a lead. But first and foremost, when I say uh, no boundary layer, uh, as this animation shows, there's just no atmosphere. Um, mm -hmm. You know, strictly speaking, Europa near the surface is about 10 to the minus eight tor. Uh, it's, um, uh, so you're just solid ice and then you've got space. And so there's no phase change to liquid water. There's no um, uh, true sort of vapor uh, above Europa, um, a, a water molecule that pops off uh, sublimes and just uh, never encounters another water molecule for another roughly thousand or more kilometers. Now, with respect to leads, um, Europa's ice is very, very thick compared to um, mm. uh, not just sea ice, but also to uh, ice sheet ice found here on Earth. Um, there's a lot, there's a, a, a large and, and uh, long-running debate about the ice thickness. Um, I'm a thin, thin ice sheller and there's thick ice shellers, but even as a thin ice shell person uh, uh, studying Europa, I'm still talking about ice that's in the range of four to 10 kilometers in thickness. Uh, the thick ice community argues that it's uh, perhaps closer to 20 kilometers in thickness. And so by Earth standards, that's incredibly thick, either way you're, you're, you slice it. Uh, and so there's no open water, there's no, um, uh, you know, the only extent to which there might be open water is if a, a fracture allows deep access through a very long crack down to the ocean or some sort of liquid water sill within the ice. And on Saturn's moon Enceladus, we do think that fractures actually connect to a subsurface ocean, but it's much different than uh, how we think about leads uh, out on the the sea ice here on Earth. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. Thank you. Are there any other questions for um, Stephen and Kevin? It looks like the Oh, Tim, go ahead. Thanks, Davey. I have a question for uh, both Steve and Kevin. My question for Steve is what happens to penitentes and really salty ice in, or, or snow uh, on this planet? That is, does the, is there an analog for very salty uh, phenomena? And to Kevin, what happens when, to that botryoidal texture when you add, say, sulfuric acid to the ice or something like that? And I'll take, take it offline. Thank you very much. Steve, why don't you go first? Um, okay. Um, salty. Mm, I actually don't know uh, of any thing that uh, that would be analogous that I can think of that occurs in um, salty ice. So salty ice would be, well, sea ice or salt flowers on sea ice, um, but maybe there's a sea ice expert in the audience who would have something to say. Is Seeley still here? Yeah, I, I guess I don't have anything to say. Yeah, and, and I would just uh, corroborate um, Steve's uh, answer in that for the most part, we don't see anything um, other than some of the, the, the frost flowers that are interesting in terms of the way brine channels express themselves on the, on the surface. Um, but I've never seen any morphologies akin to, to penitentes on sea ice. Now that's in part, there, there's a lot of 
wind erosion on sea ice and a lot of, um, of uh, morphologies that are just made by sea ice crashing into other uh, uh, parts of sea ice. So uh, then the, the question becomes, well, let's do it in the lab. And uh, we have done some experiments with the stock pot with um, sulfuric acid rich ice and salt rich ice. Um, and, uh, and we don't see penitente type morphologies. Uh, we haven't yet done it in the big arc chamber. And that's in part because um, we just want to, before we do those experiments, we want to make sure that we've um, uh, ironed out some other engineering uh, um, technical issues with the chambers that currently exist, because that's going to be a very long term experiment. And uh, salts and sulfuric acid are not particularly kind to the, um, uh, the, the pumps that we use to evacuate out the, the chamber. But stay tuned. Uh, that's on our, our goal of, of things to do. Um, I will say that we have a paper in that we're, we're working on, led by um, uh, my colleague Dan Beresford, uh, and uh, where we seeded the arc with a, um, a cake of penitentes that Jeff made. And the goal there was, well, if, if we're not seeing penitentes form from flat ice, let's put some penitentes in there and see what happens to them as they evolve or, or don't. And what we saw was that the, um, uh, the, the penitentes eroded away towards a, a flat surface in the chamber. But stay tuned for the salty ice uh, experiments. We'll, we'll be getting those done in the, well, depending on how effectively we can work in the lab during COVID, but stay tuned for those. There's a bit of an answer for you there, Steve, from uh, from uh, about uh, frost flowers on the chat. I don't know if you want to say that directly. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, okay, so that's from Seely. Yeah, I, I was just uh, sort of thinking, what do you have on sea ice? But there's, um, and so actually the answer I would say is no. We don't have anything like penit penitentes on, on sea ice. Uh, what we do have, uh, there is surface roughness. Um, of course, sea ice is usually snow covered, but when it starts melting, the snow melts in the Arctic, you get, uh, you get um, pools or puddles or ponds, they're sometimes called if they're big enough, um, that on multi-year ice, you have, um, you have hummocky topography. So you have the puddles down in a, in a trough. So you do have some surface structure that is, uh, well, there's, that, uh, there is some surface roughness, but it has nothing to do with uh, with the with the formation of penitents because uh, everything is at the same temperature and uh, you do have enhanced melting because of the lower albedo of the of the melt pond than the drained hummocks of the ice but it's uh, uh, I don't um, I wouldn't wouldn't make any connection to uh, penitents or to to a solar radiation selection even I suppose part of that is because the Arctic is so cloudy in the summer, you don't have much direct sunlight anyway. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Any last questions from anyone? Um, just to advertise next week's seminar. Tavy, there is one question that you missed in the chat. Is Sorry there? to interrupt. Sorry. Yeah. From uh, Heike Lochmus, however that's pronounced. Apologies. Yeah, uh, that's a fairly good pronunciation. Uh, so a question to Kevin about the uh, chemistry of Europa ice. Um, so when sea ice forms on Earth and goes, becomes multi-air ice, the salinity of that ice drops gradually. Uh, if the ice on Europa is really old, then has a similar process occurred on Europe as well? Or if not, then what's the reason why there is still like a sufficiently high content of various salts on Europe's that we can say that the chemistry is completely different? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it's uh, much of your question still remains to be answered and, and will be well addressed to some extent by the Europa Clipper mission. But in brief, um, the Galileo NIMS spacecraft uh, returned data that um, very strongly points to a hydrated sulfate uh, on the surface of Europa. Uh, and one of the other long-standing debates has been, is that hydrated sulfate indicative of magnesium sulfate hydrate from the ocean below, or is it indicative of uh, sulfuric acid hydrate, H2SO4, that is made on the surface of Europa radiolytically by merit of ion implantation, sulfur ion impl implantation coming from Jupiter's innermost large moon, Io. Uh, and the, these two different hypotheses for the sulfuric acid, or so, for the, the sulfate uh, feature on Europa have vastly different um, implications. One is material from an uh, endogenous material from an ocean. The other is implantation from uh, volcanic material released from a, from a neighboring moon. Now, strictly speaking with the Galileo data, I fall on the side of the sulfuric acid uh, hydrate interpretation. Uh, but there's a long debate and a lot of literature on that. More recently, um, uh, I did some lab work on, on salts and, and then uh, worked with um, some colleagues at Caltech, in particular Samantha Trumbo, who's a brilliant young graduate student. And Samantha got time on the Hubble Space Telescope and was able to see this spectroscopic feature that I observed, uh, observed in, uh, in our lab uh, after irradiating sodium chloride. And so if you're sodium chloride, uh, just neat, uh, uh, not irradiated, is basically flat. There are no uh, real diagnostic features in the visible and the infrared. But after irradiation, uh, it turns a yellowish brown and there are these color center uh, absorptions due to the trapping of electrons in the crystalline lattice. So I saw that in the lab and then Samantha was able to find that with a um, uh, Hubble Space Telescope uh, spectrum. So, um, we see these salts on Europa's surface, but that still doesn't get at your question of how, how could they be there given the rapid draining that we see in sea ice here on Earth. One mechanism for getting salt water to the surface and having it stuck there is that um, we might have plumes erupting out of Europa's ice. And so you get direct surface emplacement of salts and oceanic water on top of existing ice. And so the areas where we see the spectroscopic signature of salts could in fact be active areas on Europa where plumes are erupting and delivering this, this salty ocean water. But if you have kind of a, a pull apart region where then water rises up and, and freezes at depth and then becomes buoyant and rises, you're absolutely right. We would expect it to drain. So uh, the, uh, the geologic mechanisms for getting, uh, for explaining the salt on the surface are, are highly varied. Um, so we see the salt, uh, how exactly it gets there remains to be figured out. Thanks very much for that. There's a final question from Hester on the uh, chat. Are you still? I'm here. <laughs> I can ask it. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think there may be a problem with that. It's a bit too dry, so you may not actually have enough snowfall. But there is a lot of salt deposits on the on the Tibetan plateau, and I was wondering if that, rather than sea ice, which is at low latitudes and low elevations, you can oh. go to the higher regions to find. Are there penitentes in the Himalaya? Uh, yes, there are. Um, so. Was your question particularly about salt or um, I don't think salt has been shown to have any, or I can't think of any place where we would see effects of salt. There are actually, even in uh, Antarctica, in uh, the dry valleys, there are, well, very short penitents because they have to go, grow at such a large angle that they fall over from gravity before they get very large. Um, and they're on north facing uh, slopes, yeah. Um, 
maybe 10 centimeters long. Um, and they, but I don't know of any, uh, or can't think of anything that would involve salt particularly. Um, yeah. That's a neat idea though. Uh, uh, I don't know enough about those lakes, uh, Hester, but it'd be, if you're interested in doing some work there, it'd be fun to, to see what happens uh, in those environments. The, the salt part of my question was part in response to Timothy's question because he asked about salt. So. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, you're not just asking about uh, salt. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and some salty lakes have been studied in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. There's some salty lakes. Um, and uh, actually even fairly close to uh, fairly close to home there there are salt lakes in uh, eastern Oregon and uh, in Utah so um, it'd be it'd be more exotic to go to Tibet but we could probably do experiments closer to home too okay uh, unless there's any final questions on the chat um, I think it comes to say thank you very much to uh, Steve and Kevin, and to just uh, remind everyone that the um, seminar next week will be given by Martin Tranter, Alex Inicio, and Leanne Benning, and will be on biological darkening of the Greenland ice sheet. And I'm sorry, there is no pretty advertising slide this week. It hasn't been produced yet. But uh, thanks very much to both of you. Snow is an amazing... Uh, <laughs> Um, substance, isn't it? And forms all sorts of wonderful things. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tavi and Steve, yeah. and, and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Take care. Yeah, thank you, Tavi. Thank you, Kevin.